So today I want to talk about your mind on God. And um, Nancy spoke about it a little bit in, in her story. Um, what happened for her and with her when she allowed and when she allowed then her mind was uh, her brain was on God. Mm -hmm. Her brain and her mind. Not just the mind, the mind but the brain is on God. So I want to talk about that we're all storytellers and we're all telling stories to ourselves, to other people, and uh, sometimes those stories bend reality in a way that um, is not true. Um, and, and sometimes we bend reality to the truth, which of course is where we want to go. When we pray or even think, we are telling the law, the law of cause and effect, a story. A story that we want present in our lives, and that we believe are present in our lives. <coughs> so I want to tell you a little quick story. Um, have you uh, heard about the two wolves story? Has anybody heard that story? Well, you might have mm -hmm. so, no. so a Cherokee elder is teaching his grandchildren about life. And they say, and he, he says, a fight is going on inside of me. It is a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. One wolf represents fear, anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, pride, superiority. Oh my gosh, what a list. Lies, 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 the grandfather says. Now the other wolf <coughs> is telling me stories and is standing for joy, peace, love, grace, hope, sharing, humility, kindness, benevolence. All these things, generosity, compassion, faith, and truth. And he looks at his grandchildren and he says, this same fight is going on inside each of you right here and right now and every other person all over the world. The wide-eyed kids kind of look up and they say, they, they kind of think about it for a second and then one of them says, well, well, well grandfather, which wolf will win in this fight? Grandfather smiles and says, the one I feed, the one I feed. So my question for you is, what, what are you feeding your mind right now? Are you feeding your mind spirit? Are you feeding your mind this, this wonderful stuff? Or are you feeding your mind fear and past junk? and experiences that you had that uh, some, for some reason and traumas that you want to hold on to, what are you feeding your mind? Thoreau said, my desire for knowledge is intermittent, but my desire to bathe my head in atmospheres unknown to my feet is <laughs> perennial and constant. Remember, Thoreau went out to live in the woods. The highest that we can attain to is not knowledge, but sympathy with intelligence. Not sympathy as, oh, I feel sorry for you with intelligence, but connection, that kind of sympathy with intelligence, with God, with spirit. I came up with this talk title and the idea with this book because with this uh, talk because I was reading this book called How God Changes Your Brain, written by Andrew Newberg, uh, a an MD who's actually a, a neurologist, and Mark Robert Waldman. You might recognize those names because they write a column for the Science of Mind magazine every month, where they connect, which I love so much. And which Dr. Holmes, of course, did in his, his way. They connect science and spirituality. So in this book, they're talking about, and it's mostly kind of scientific in a lot of ways, but they're talking about the science of faith. What faith does, and you know, they, they can attach stuff to you, and they can look at what fires in the brain, et cetera, et cetera. 
when you're in a when you're in mindfulness, when you're in a in a, a state of faith, a being of faith. And they talk a lot about the brain's uh, plasticity, which I've talked about a lot here, and I don't want to get into the science of that so much right now. But they were talking about the reasons that we change our lives, the reasons that we change our perspective on lives, the reasons that we can listen to spirit and go to Starbucks and sing the Star Spangled Banner <laughs> on a holiday. <laughs> And those reasons for change are, of course, desire, focus, <clears throat> what are you feeding, what are you focusing your wool, conscious regulation of breath, posture, body movements, and practice. All those things are how we change one perspective to another, how we change one belief into the optimized version of that belief. The mechanism for change is faith. And I know I bring up these words that, that equate to religion and all that scary <laughs> stuff. And, and just like the month when, when we spent that month taking back things that we've allowed um, the, the negativity of what we don't like about a religion to take them over, we need to take back words. God's one for many people. Faith is one for many yeah. people, but we need to jump in and, and, and take back the word, take back the definition. Faith is not a bad thing. They call it mindfulness now. <laughs> you can call it anything you want. That's why when, when we're talking about um, the divine, I may say God, divine, um, Steve Apperson likes Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. And whatever you want to call that idea, which is usually called faith, that attaches you and connects you and makes you more aware and revealing that power that is within each and every one of us. That's how God changes our brain. And when God changes our brain because we are allowing that faith to be the most part of us, then we have the courage to Go to Starbucks and sing the Star Spangled Banner. Make that phone call. Go on that date. Get that interview. Buy that suit for those who heard the suit <laughs> yeah. story yeah. last week. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Um, and here, here's another great thing that they. Oh, well, well, let me let me mention something. When you're in faith. It stops you from ruminating. And I love that, because when I read that, I went, ruminating? What does that mean? I thought ruminating just meant you know, thinking a lot, uh, con uh, concentrating on one idea. No, ruminating is when you focus on fear and anger and all that negative junk. That's ruminating. <laughs> ruminating is like when you, um, it's, it's sort of like taking um, syrup and just drenching yourself in fear and lack and limitation. That's ruminating. Ruminating is kind of a negative thing. And faith and meditation and prayer, whatever you want to equate prayer to, is the opposite of ruminating. Now, some of you may say, you know what? I, I, I have a long day at work, and my work, I'm staring at a computer, and I'm constantly thinking all day. The last thing I want to do when I get home is think some more and be <laughs> mindful and sit down and meditate and all that kind of stuff. My mind is tired, you would tell me. Here's the simple thing. You don't sit down and you don't think. That's why I did a lot of the, uh, the meditation today had to do with that. You don't sit down and think. You sit down and you breathe. And you get, you get attached to your breath. And you get aware of your breath. And you'll find that when you get there, your neural pathways, to be sort of scientific, your brain starts getting rested. Rested enough that you're like, well, while I'm here, might as well meditate. While I'm here, I might as well do some spiritual mind treatment. 
and step into a life where I don't come home where my mind is tired. I come home refreshed and excited that I, I met all my challenges, quote unquote, today, and I had a great day at work or wherever you are. Um, some of you may have heard of Jill uh, Volte Taylor. She has an extremely famous TED Talk. Yeah. And she wrote a book, or a couple of books, actually. Um, at the age of 37, she had a stroke. Now, um, she is a Harvard-trained neuroanatomist. And what happened was she experienced a severe hemorrhage in the left hemisphere of her brain. This happened in 1996. So she lost judgment. She lost critical analysis. Mm -hmm. She lost logic. Um, she lost a lot of uh, education. She lost past and future. She didn't. She was. She couldn't remember old things, and she didn't care about future things like we so often do. Um, she was just right there in the now. She was right in. The, she was right in the right hemisphere, in the present moment. Now, because of her education, interestingly enough, she was able to be aware of what was going on with her. She was able to call 911, et cetera, et cetera, get herself to the hospital, and it did take her um, a few years, two or three years, to get totally back, as they say, for that for the right and left hemisphere to, you know, talk to talk to each other and be in balance. But let me read something she wrote in an interview about being in, in um, the right hemisphere so much. And for me, it was a total experience of peacefulness and euphoria. The blue sky is always there, is something that uh, people say. And to me, the blue sky is the consciousness of the right hemisphere. And then the clouds come in, which is the consciousness of the left hemisphere, and the verbiage and, the, and, and all the blocking, and it blocks our ability to see the blue sky. You see where she's coming from? When logic, when my, when my, my list, when all that stuff that, that, that kind of pushes the divine part of our brain, our mind, aside, when that shows up, it kind of puts you out of that that consciousness that the left brain is so uh, um, working for. And it blocks our ability to see the blue sky. But the blue sky is always there. And to me, that's what going on, that's what's going on with our consciousness. We always have that blue sky, that right hemisphere experience of euphoria at the essence of what we are. We always have the option, moment by moment, of saying in that moment, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to look at the world around me. I'm, I'm going to escape all things around me. I'm going to escape all the things I'm thinking about. And I'm just going to pay attention to the, how the air feels. How the air feels. How the temperature of the air feels. And my breath. And she says, look at the colors in the field around me. Stop thinking and analyzing everything that is going on in your left hemisphere. All the jargon, all the stuff, all the past, all those beliefs that get in your way, all the goals, all the lists. And consciously choose to have that experience at any moment. We are biologically, here's a little science, we are biologically designed to have this experience of feeling at one with all that is. That is your brain on God. That right hemisphere. Zapping. Snapping those, those synapses there. And it is always there, like the blue sky, whether the clouds are there or not. The blue sky is always there. We may not see it because we're not looking. So if you want to see the blue sky, even on a cloudy day, you got to click into, scientifically, you got to click into your right hemisphere, which then brings you here. Brings your mind to God. 
and those chemicals start zapping around. And I was talking about that a few weeks ago. I don't want to get too much into the science and stuff. But, you know, the chemicals start zapping around. And when those chemicals start zapping around, especially from your right hemisphere, all of our anxieties get lower or gone. Depression, relaxation. Depression starts going away. Relaxation comes in. And we get lit up in a good way. Like the sun, we get lit up. It's warm. It's peaceful. It's our mind on God. So here's, here's a little thing that we can all do. What lights you up in a positive way? What music? Is it music? Is it some form of music? Well, if that's so, then why is that, be, that being turned on? Why is that not the second thing you do when you put your keys down, for those who do that, on the table as you walk into the door? Why isn't there a button right there where that music starts? So that your house is filled with Mozart, Gary Lynn Floyd, <laughs> Jamie Lula, Elvis, <laughs> whoever, whatever. <laughs> Why, um, why, is, uh, why is this affirmation not on your um, bathroom mirror this week when you get home? Or on your refrigerator? Or on that, um, that uh, bulletin board that you have by the kitchen? Why is that not up? Maybe make a little collage of all the ones that you've collected. So that you put your keys down, you start the music, and you go, oh yeah. I am in unity with the divine. Okay, I'm walking around with that for the rest of the day. I'm home from work. I am in unity with the divine. Setting ourselves up for an environment where our brain can naturally, and our minds can naturally be on God, be on the divine, and revealing that divine so that we can vibrate that energy within us as we're cleaning up, changing our clothes, getting ready to do some exercise, whatever it is. Now, you might say, well, do I need God, or do I need whatever I use the term of God? Um, no, it's just a term. You don't have to, you don't have to equate um, your mind being on God with your mind being on God. Who cares? <laughs> Call it what you want. I'm just being myself. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's just an energy. It's a vibration. It's a frequency that we step into. And even if we don't take the moment to consciously do it, we can create the environment where you naturally just flow into it. And you'll see a difference in your life. You'll see a difference in those, those few hours after you get home from work and, you know, there's chores there, too. There's dinner. There's changing clothes. Sometimes you, some people exercise at night, you know, before you get to watching that episode for the 450th time of Friends. <laughs> I totally get it. I totally get it. The name is irrelevant. God, divine, getting, getting, in, getting my brain centered. The term is irrelevant. The, the doing is what's relevant here. So they have five fundamental neurological truths that coincide with new thoughts in this book. And I, and I want to bring those out because, again, I want to show you that science um, is proving, if you need scientific proof, if you can't just have faith <laughs> and knowing through, even through the logical side of your brain, that this stuff works, that this stuff is real, that this stuff is truth, that this stuff can bend reality, as we're talking about all month, meaning something lousy um, happens in, in front of you. Well, yeah, you recognize that's not a good thing, but I can step around it. I can help and still step around it. I can keep my neutrality and still have compassion for what happened in front of me. I don't need to stop and gawk. I can stop and help, um, uh, physically help if, if that's uh, needed, and, and you have the uh, uh, ability to do that. But I, I can also go by saying I'm walking, or usually a lot of that stuff happens while you're in the car. I can go by and just know in my heart everything that needs to happen 
it, it's perfect right action right here and right now. The ambulance is here, the assistance is here, whatever is needed is here to provide whatever. Or whatever's happening in front of you. So these are the five things. Your thoughts clearly affect the neurological functioning of, of your body. And I talked about that a few weeks ago. It is scientifically proven. Your thoughts. Thoughts are things. How many times have we heard that in new thought in, in different ways? In, in, in even in the non-spiritual, non-religious ways. You know, the science of mind book, of course, talks about that. But now you can equate the science of mind with religion and a faith and a philosophy and all that. But, you know, Wayne Dyer said it too. Uh, people before Ernest Holmes said it. Number two, optimism is essential for maintaining a healthy brain. The simple act of optimism. You don't have to know at first that it's going exactly the way you've decided, but you're optimistic about it. Optimism is your first step into faith. Number three, positive thoughts neurologically suppress negative thoughts. And they consciously also optimize the positive thoughts you already have. They prove this scientifically. Number four, when you change the way you think, you begin to change your outward circumstances. How they prove that scientifically, I don't know. I'm, we have proved it, and I'm sure you've proved it if you take the time to sit and think about um, what, you've, uh, um, what you were focusing on, what you were feeding your mind, and then feeding the environment, and then the great experience that showed up. And number five, consciousness, reality, your mind and your spiritual beliefs are profoundly interconnected and inseparable from the functioning of your brain. Your brain is improved just by the fact and the truth that you're here, listening, being, taking part. And I want you to know that, and I want you to, to feel, to, to gain confidence by that. Just the fact that you show up here um, is improving your life. And when you consciously step into that and realize that and take hold of that, you're going to really see it blossom. You're going to bust through, soar, and zoom in, in many ways. So what we need to do is we need to get in the zone. We need to, at home, create the zone. I'm not talking about spiritual practice. Spiritual practice is its own, it's this whole thing. Spiritual mind treatment, prayer, affirmative prayer, uh, meditation, visualization, visioning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's its own thing. I'm just talking about bringing the environment of having your uh, mind um, with God in your home and, in, and at the office, too. That's why you put pictures up at the office. Because it becomes home. And there's love there. And love is very powerful. And when you're at work, you know, you can always go, huh. when you look up and you see the grandchild, or you see the best friend, or you see um, the picture of, of a, you know, that Kodak moment at Disneyland. Oh, that was fun. Okay, wow. Okay, I can get through the rest of the day now. That's your mind on God. You can call it what you want. But that's your mind on God. So get in the zone. Get everything that you need in order to get into the zone. Turn on the music when you first get home. Exercise. Yawn. Yawn is a spiritual practice, just like breathing. Yawn <laughs> just changes your whole life. I have um, a Pilates teacher that I go to, and she is big on yawning. Not as a spiritual, well, probably as a spiritual practice too, but in that moment, the yawning opens yourself up, not only physically, but mentally, so that, and then all of a sudden, I can stretch. I get taller somehow. Just in the yawn during this specific exercise, it's like, wow, where did that muscle come from? Or how did that muscle get loose just by me pretending to yawn? That's a spiritual practice. And you know, like I said, neg negative experiences may show up around us. But when, when we have a, a mind on God, 
those negative experiences take on a, a different role, a different experience. Yeah, you might be sad. Yeah, you might be angry. Yeah, yeah those kind of feelings may show up. But you're going to find yourself <coughs> stepping into um, a neutrality much quicker. So that these emotions, especially the negative emotions, don't overwhelm you and stop you and, and you know, make you freeze like a deer in the headlights. You know, oh, God, that sucks. Ooh, that hurt. Or, ah, oh, oh, didn't I have a 20 in my pocket? <laughs> yeah, I did. And it's going to the perfect person. And I'll just charge this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. <laughs> you know? It's the suit story. I can afford $300 suit. I ended up buying a $1,200 suit with all the accessories, and three days later received a check for $500 in the mail that I forgot I was owed. <laughs> that pretty much paid for all of it, between my budget and that extra $500. Because I was... And I quit myself because when, as you've heard in this story, I, I had to stop and go, okay, hold on, you are being overwhelmed by this whole situation just to buy a stupid suit. Stupid suit, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and um, you need to chill out. And so I did. And boy, did things show up quickly. I'm not saying I didn't have resistance when I learned that the suit was $700 before I even bought shirts and ties and stuff. I didn't, I'm not saying I didn't have resistance, but because I put myself in, and my mind in God, my mind in the divine, my mind in that, that area, I got into neutrality about it, and then got into the excitement about it. Of course, Patty helped with the excitement. <laughs> I put this. I put the suit on and I came out of the dressing room and she went, oh, like, you know, all of a sudden I was Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, um, so when that happens, you're going to see gratitude stepping in, you're going to see neutrality arise, and, and, and it won't be without compassion. That compassion won't go away. The, oh, that sucks, or, gee, I wish I wouldn't have lost that $100 bill, that's going to suck but not for long. And you're not going to ruminate about it, which is the great thing. That's what happens when your mind is on God. So what I want to say is, I, is set yourself up, up for that. Set yourself up in the environment. And I'm not talking about spiritual practice. That's a whole other thing, and that's a whole other talk, spiritual practice. And you're going to hear that over and over and over again. I'm talking about the non well, the non-classical spiritual practice. Creating an environment at your home, at your work, in your car, where you're surrounded by love, you're surrounded by things that remind you that love is everywhere. And you are love, and you are powerful, and life is as great as you desire. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.